95% of all UFO sightings can be immediately identified. It's the 5% that give you the release. Oh! Pilots chase them sometimes, but can't catch them. There are near misses between these things and commercial aircraft. And you saw the disc uh, of it. These are very hard to dismiss, the, the handful of sightings. A UFO in broad daylight near Paris. We suddenly observed a very bright red-orange object. It was oval. UFOs have interfered with missiles. I saw something that defied logic. What was that? The luminous part of a strange craft, triangular in shape, on the triangular shape craft. Mystery craft being seen. Dark metallic in appearance. Flying craft. There's an orange orb. Glowing orb. A glowing orb. A giant ball of light. Glowing object. Could be aliens. Some sort of aliens. Let's continue to take a look at UFOs, the great last day's deception. But that's still not all. The fifth reason why the Bible says UFOs are clearly demonic in origin is because they act like demons, okay? Now folks, maybe it's just me, but again, this is kind of strange. It just so happens another strange feature or characteristics of UFOs is they typically appear to people who have some history or involvement in occult practices, okay? Uh, what happens is it seems like there's a pattern that once you engage in these occult demonic practices, wonders of wonders, guess what? You just open the door of all things for UFO contact to also start coming in. I kind of find that a little bit strange. In fact, not just me, that's exactly what these researchers are also saying about the issue. Let's take a look. Uh, one researcher stated, quote, an inordinately high percentage of the abductees have had previous experience with the occult. He says, I, I remember when I was younger and into seances, necromancy, and psychokinesis and astral projection, that one night I looked into the sky and saw a very bright light that moved at an extremely high rate of speed and made sudden and severe changes in direction during its flight. It moved extremely fast and accelerated out of sight as it moved high into the night sky and disappeared. I saw this with my own eyes, but it doesn't stop there. During my occult days, he says, I also saw many other unusual manifestations, heard voices, and saw things move. I could go on, but suffice it to say that I confirmed the findings of those who experience UFO phenomenon, and they are very often involved in the occult. This, he says, is alarming and a major warning. He says, my conclusion is that the UFO phenomenon is occultic in origin and demonically based. He says, I do not believe there is life on other planets, and I suspect that what has been manifested is nothing more than a great deception that is slowly enveloping mankind. In fact, other researchers state uh, this, uh, quote, in fact, we know of no UFO contactee who is not basically a spiritistic medium. And again, Jacques Vallée, he says this, he says, it is the rule rather than the exception to find significant UFO sightings preceded or followed by other anomalies, notably of the poltergeist variety, okay? So, let me see, you get involved in the occult and UFOs appear? I find that kind of interesting. In fact, let me give you an actual testimony of two people that I personally know who've had encounters uh, with UFOs, okay? And, and one is a lady named Christine, who uh, lives in Oregon. I've talked with her many times. I personally interviewed her on this issue. And the other is another good friend of mine named Bud who lives in Arizona. And I asked both of them to write down their background and what they uh, experienced. And let me share with you now what they shared with me. Let's take a look. Christine says this, she says, my father, when he was in the military, got heavily involved with the occult. He said that he was in a seance with some of his clan and the table started levitating and they heard voices. They all ran out of the room and these phantom things followed. He didn't say too much more about the experience. The weird thing is he says that a bald man sits by him at night and tells him what the kids are doing. Then there was a Ouija board at our house from my father. 
Somehow we got a hold of it and started playing with it, and we would hear scratching inside the walls of the house after that, and to this day, that house scares the heck out of me, she says. There is something there not godly, okay? But then here's what Bud shared. He says this, he says, Growing up, I was always fascinated about the possibility of other life out there. I could not get enough about them. So while surfing the net about them and ghost hunting, etc., he said, I ran across a video that showed you how to make them show up on demand. It worked so well, I would invite family and friends over on weekends to witness it, and we would have barbecues and play with this. However, it wasn't long before I started seeing dark shadows pass over me and around the yard. They were darker than the night, uh, but, but, but so dark, though, you could still see them. Hard to explain, he says, but true. I, I never said anything to anyone so they would not get scared, plus I really didn't know what I was seeing. It wasn't until a few weeks later that my second oldest daughter asked me, Dad, what are those dark things that fly over us? When I heard that, I just got the chills, he said, and my eyes even started to water. It was such a strange feeling because I guess I was hoping that maybe it was just me. So I caught my breath and said, so you see them also, huh? Then my youngest daughter says, Dad, I see them all over the yard and in my room. And it hit me hard, he said, because she had been telling me something uh, would bother her at night and, and threw her stuffed animals at her when she was sleeping and then would hold her down. I even slept on her floor one night to show her that there was nothing to be scared of. In fact, I set a video camera uh, up to, to prove to her that nothing happens while uh, we're sleeping. Well, I couldn't show her that video because she was right and I was wrong. Then one night he says, my wife and uh, kids who had took the puppies outside to let them run before a bed and my daughter ran back in telling me uh, and the mom that, that to come in, in the backyard and look at this. And he said, when I got outside, I looked up and this huge reaper shaped thing was gliding in the air going around our house. It looked like silk flying in the wind, but it kept circling our house. So I walked up uh, to about 10 feet from it and it just stared back at me. I, I could not see a face, but the hood was facing right at me. It, it was a windy full moon night. And when I saw it fly in front of me, I said, God, what is that? And we didn't talk much about it. After that, he says, and still don't today. We no longer watch videos on ghost hunting, UFOs, or even scary movies, etc. We know, he says, who they are and what they want. And they want to mess you up because that's exactly what demons do. And so is it really surprising that once you start messing with the demonic occult uh, and, and uh, you get involved in demonic issues and, and practices and demonic teachings, that it just happens to open up the door as well to demonic UFO activity? I don't think so, folks. I think it's one and the same once you look at the facts. But that's still not all. The sixth reason why the Bible says UFOs are clearly demonic in origin is because they possess like demons. Now, folks, as we already saw earlier in this study, the Bible clearly teaches how people can become possessed by demons, right? Well, I mean, it's all over the Bible, as we saw several different cases, but again, wonder of wonders, uh, guess what also these UFO occupants just happen to do? That's right, they just happen to possess people just like demons, shocker. In fact, so much so that even other researchers see the obvious connection. Let's take a look. Once again, John Ankerberg shares, quote, perhaps there is no more striking hallmark of the occult than that of spirit possession. There are literally thousands of documented cases, many involving very ugly endings. But this phenomenon is similar, if not identical, to the possession of UFO contactees, as well as some close encounter UFO cases. Whether in the occult or ufology, the person is taken over by the invading entity, sometimes voluntarily, sometimes involuntarily, and controlled by the creature for whatever purposes it has in mind. Among UFO contactees or others who communicate personally with alleged extraterrestrials, there are also literally thousands of cases of what can only be termed as spirit possession. Incidents of possessions are mentioned by Kiel and Steiger, Norman, Cato, Valley, Schwartz, Reeve, and a dozen other researchers. Indeed, a large number of UFO contactees had an occult or mediumistic background even prior to contact. 
Adamski, Van Taskel, Minger, all the way up to Whitley Stryber experienced this. In fact, we have personally talked, he says, with a number of alleged abductees and or contactees who have been clearly demon-possessed, and many spirit-possessed mediums who are not even seeking UFO communication may end up being contacted and becoming channels for both the dead and extraterrestrials. The fact that these supposed advanced beings from outer space prefer, listen, to possess their contacts after the manner of demons is further evidence that we're dealing with an occult phenomenon, he states. And then, just like you'd expect with actual demonic possession, why is it that there's only one way on record to get rid of these UFO occupants, these beings, when they do come your way? And why is it it just happens to be when you command them in the name of Jesus Christ to leave, and they do, as this next video shows. Let's take a look. This phenomenon was a real phenomenon. This was something that was actually happening to these people. I was like paralyzed. I, I what you call like a little move. being, but it was he was luminescent like light. The big bulbous head, the out. gray skin. What I saw was a uh, typical gray. Big black eyes. Two and a half, three feet tall. They all were dealing with something that was very unusual from a human perspective. This was something I felt that we needed an answer to because at this point in time there were no answers. My name is Joe Jordan, and I'm the State Section Director for the Mutual UFO Network for Bavard County, Florida. I'm also Lead Field Investigator. When we get a call for an investigation, we take all the information we could over the phone, and then we send investigators out, sometimes myself, sometimes other investigators working with me, and we'd follow up to do an investigation report to these people, they were sincere, they had sincere experiences, and they were looking, a lot of them looking for help, and they felt that being that we were involved as researchers and investigators, that we could be some help to them. My name is Joyce Ahrens. Um, I'm a floral designer. I was laying in the bed, my husband and I, and I was laying on my right side. And all I could see when I opened my eyes, all I could see was this red light above the window. And I could see my husband's shoulder, but I was like paralyzed. His skin looked like elephant skin. He had the big bulbous head with the big wraparound eyes. As an honest researcher, I realized that I couldn't just count these people out because there's the stuff that they had was so bizarre. Most of the researchers in the realm had said it wasn't possible to, to stop an experience. Knowing that, I called some of the leading researchers in the country. So I said, guys, I've got a very unusual case here. This man, we'll use the name Bill, and during his experience, <gasps> in fear, he calls out, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus or Jesus, please help me. By calling out, he abruptly stops his abduction experience. These entities can be stopped in the name and authority of Jesus Christ. Once down in Coco, this was after I accepted Jesus Christ, they tried to come. And I kept saying, no, no, you're not doing this. And I took on the empowerment of Jesus Christ, and I stopped that. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. These are spiritual enemies. Taking on the empowerment of Jesus Christ puts a stop to a lot of things. And he's helped me a great deal. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Now, folks, come on. I mean, of all things, to stop an alien encounter or abduction is to rebuke them in the name of Jesus Christ and they flee? I mean, come on, that's exactly what demons do. That's what they have to do. They have to obey Jesus Christ, his authority and the authority in his name. That's what the Bible says. Mark chapter one, 
Verse 23 through 27 says, Just then a man in their synagogue, who was possessed by an evil spirit, cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, said Jesus sternly. Come out of him. The evil spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. The people were all so amazed that they asked each other, What is this? A new teaching? And with authority? He even gives order to the evil spirits, and they obey him. And we already saw that one, but Mark chapter 3, verse 11 through 12 says this, Whenever the evil spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God. But he gave orders, uh, strict orders uh, to them not to tell who he was. Mark chapter 5, verse 1 through 13. They went across the lake to the region of the Gerasenes. When Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an evil spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs, and no one can bind him any more, not even with a chain. For he had been often chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills he would cry out and cut himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? Swear to God that you won't torture me. For Jesus had said to him, Come out of this man, you evil spirit. Then Jesus asked him, What is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send him out of the area. A large herd of pigs was feeding on the nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, Send us among the pigs. Allow us to go into them. And he, Jesus, gave them permission. Did you see that? He gave them permission. And the evil spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. And again, why is it of all methodologies that will get rid of these UFO occupants is that again, when they come your way, you command them in the name of Jesus Christ to leave and they do. <laughs> Folks, that's what demons do. They have to obey the authority of Jesus Christ like this next video shows. Let's take a look at this one. At first, everything was normal. The house appeared normal. Um, there really was nothing unusual. 521 was the new home of the Moe family. Dean and Jennifer moved their nine children across the state of Oregon to pastor a church. But as time went on, after the first couple of weeks, it, our children started coming to me, um, asking me what, what I wanted. They'd ask me, um, why do you call me mom? Why do you keep calling my name? And it wouldn't be me. It wouldn't be me that had, had called them to me. Like we would get told to do stuff, and then we would do it. Like mom asked us for ice water, and then we went and gave her ice water, and she said thank you, but she didn't ask for it. Dean tried to protect his family from what he thought was a physical being. Then as time went on, I'd be laying there in bed, and it, I would hear what sounded like somebody coming up the steps from the basement when we didn't have anybody downstairs. And I was concerned, first of all, that we might have had an intruder in the house, so I'd jump out of bed and go grab something and then open up the door of the basement, there wouldn't be anybody there. 14-year-old Charles felt like he was being watched when he went down to the basement. I was putting a box of Christmas stuff inside there and then the door slammed and I was trying to get out. I couldn't get out, it was shut, it wouldn't open. It felt like it was locked. At that point I knew, I knew that it was a demon presence in our house. Um, none of our kids would go downstairs without having the upstairs door open and you had to stand there at that doorway and watch for them and wait so that they could shout to you if they needed you to come back upstairs. They would sleep in our room, actually on our floor at one point, or in the living room floor. They wouldn't even go into bedrooms and sleep. They wanted to be that close to mom and dad. Eventually, Jennifer couldn't sleep at night either where I'd be asleep and usually there would just be a flash of light that would flash into my face and that would wake me up and there'd either be somebody's face in my face or somebody at the end of the bed or somebody in the hall that I could see or, um, or music, just strange music that would play that, um, in the middle of the night. Dean and Jennifer fasted and prayed over this supernatural activity in their home. And 
it left was almost like a temper tantrum that it had on its way out where it flung all the books around off of one of its bookcases. It's all gone. So definitely a house set free. And when I came home, everybody was more relaxed. The children were just um, more playful. Uh, just everything in the house felt so much better and, and just that tension had been released. Just reiterates over and over again the power of our God um, compared to Satan. I mean, he's still, regardless of anything that he tries or anything he does, Satan is definitely in subjection to our God. Greater is he that is in, in me than he that is in the world. It's absolutely a true statement. It's absolutely true. When the evil spirit used to come into me, I wanted to kill my husband. Gita Sharma knew she'd been cursed by witchcraft. Demonic thoughts ran through her mind as she walked the crowded streets of New Delhi, India. No one was safe, especially her husband. I gave a lot of money to black magicians for spells and drugs to try and get these evil spirits away from me. But nothing changed. I wanted to die. I wanted to kill. It was pure hatred. One day, I even thought of killing everyone with poison and then kill myself. But Gita turned on a TV program that taught there was someone more powerful than black magic. His name? Jesus Christ. I thought Jesus might be able to help me, so I dialed the phone number and asked them to pray for me. Phone counselor in New Delhi prayed with Gita and helped her to accept Jesus as her savior. Then Gita put her newfound faith into action. I told the evil spirit, you don't have any authority over me because I am a child of God. The evil spirit fled. A feeling of peace filled Gita's heart and mind. My life has completely changed. I speak with love to everyone, to my husband, to my mother, and to my brothers and sisters. All right, let me see if I can get this straight now. Uh, demons flee in the name of Jesus Christ, and aliens flee in the name of Jesus Christ. Anybody seeing a connection here? Okay, in fact, folks, it becomes even more obvious when you listen to the rest of Christine's testimony. Let's take a look at what else she shared in her story. Let's take a look. Here's what she shares. She says, my twin sister and brother and I were left alone for the day on our farm in Oregon. I was eight years old and my brother was 12 years old. The day was hot and we were playing in our front yard when we heard a strange humming noise and saw shadows come across the lawn. At first I thought it was airplanes, but my brother said, they are back. I asked him what, and he said these strange things that come and visit you, but you have to run and hide. Being in the front yard, there were trees and shrubbery, but there really wasn't anywhere to hide. I, I don't know why we didn't go inside, she said. She actually wrote this, duh. And then she continued, she said, it was only a matter of minutes when these objects landed in our field and another field right outside our own on the other side of the fence that grew green. My brother told my sister and I to hide and we frantically tried finding a spot but couldn't. These creatures were everywhere and I mean they were in droves. She said we stopped at the mimosa tree and decided to let destiny fall where it may not know anything else to do. While the other same creatures surrounded the house, three of them approached us. They tried talking us into going with them and my brother told us not to because we would never return. How he knew that, I don't know, but I think something happened to him before. And he said they do sexual things to you. My brother said the only thing to get these creatures away is, listen to this folks, by saying out loud, not thinking it, quote, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to leave. And she says, as soon as we said those words, the three left immediately. In fact, listen to this. She said one of them tripped on the gravel and left is what she said, that he tripped on the gravel and left a scuff mark going to the pod that was in the other farm's land. Had to get out there real fast, okay? She said, then we watched all of them take off, especially the one where the creatures boarded. The sound became intense like a whirling and then extreme heat and then took off kind of midway, stopped in the sky and then shot off into the clouds. She says this interesting statement, that's when I knew they hid in the clouds. Now, what I find interesting is, uh, speaking of clouds in the air, isn't it interesting how the Bible says this in reference to Satan? The book of Ephesians chapter 2 verse 2 states, The prince of the power of the air, of the spirit 
that is now working in the sons of disobedience, speaking of Satan. And in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12 states, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the where? In the heavenly places. And then Christine concludes with this, I can tell you that they obey God's word just like a demon has to. But that's still not all. Christine and the other people in the video are not the only ones who experienced the rebuking of an alien slash demon in the name of Jesus Christ. So have many, many other people. Check out what these independent researchers have discovered. Very interesting characteristics. Please pay attention. Let's take a look. One uh, gentleman stated, far, quote, far from the abductee population, including all those with religious beliefs, there, listen to this, there is one group of people that by and large is notably absent. They are Christians, those who are often these days unflatteringly described as Christian fundamentalists, okay? He says many people in the world claim to be a Christian, that is they have Christian ideals or morality and may even regard themselves as quote, good people. He says, but I'm talking about what are known as born again, Bible-believing Christian. It is as if the ETs tend to avoid this select group of people. This reality has been largely ignored by many UFO researchers. Muslims, Buddhists, Jews, agnostics, all seem to claim abduction experiences. As more case studies were examined, a puzzling trend emerged. The so-called Christians reporting the abduction experience tended to be people who intellectually espouse the existence of God, but didn't personally apply it, i.e. they weren't true Christians, only in name only. He says, but there seemed to be an obvious absence of devout, Bible-believing, walk-the-walk type Christians. He says, where were they in this equation? And he says this, one, one experience by a Mr. Bill D took place at Christmas in Florida in 1976. His abduction started out typically, uh, i.e. late, uh, at night in bed. Early in the evening, he saw some anomalous lights through his living room window over a forest north of his home. He assumed it was a police helicopter searching for drug runners or something there in Florida. So whatever it was, it agitated his dogs for several hours thereafter. He eventually went to bed. He was lying in bed, kept wide awake by the barking dogs when paralysis all of a sudden set in. He said he was unable to cry out. He could see nothing but a whitish gray like a, a, a mist or a fog, although he sensed something or someone was in his room. His wife didn't awaken, and the next thing he knew, he was being levitated above his bed. By this time, he was al alive with terror, but he couldn't scream. And here's where the story becomes very interesting. He states this, quote, so helpless, I couldn't do anything. I said, listen, quote, Jesus, Jesus, help me. He said, when I did, there was a feeling or sound or, or something that either my words that I thought or the words that I had tried to say or whatever had hurt whatever was holding me up. I fell, I hit the bed because it was like I was thrown back in the bed. I, I really can't tell, but when I did, my wife woke up and asked why I was jumping on the bed. This was the first time that experienced field investigators had ever heard of an abduction being stopped and this man did it by just calling on the name of Jesus. Another experience of stopping an abduction with the name of Jesus Christ goes like this. One man shared, back in 1973, quote unquote, my wife had a strange experience in the middle of the night. At the time, we knew nothing about UFO abductions, so we had no category in which to place it other than extremely lucid nightmare. Uh, it has many of the abduction components, the, the point is that she stopped the entities and the whole experience with the name of Jesus. And they said this, listen, it is vital to get this information out. In addition, these days, the Christian church is not equipped to deal with such reports because the UFO phenomenon has been largely misunderstood and dismissed by organized religions. Yet, as the number of cases mounted, the data showed that in every instance where the victim knew to invoke the name of Jesus Christ, the event stopped, period. The evidence, he says, was becoming increasingly difficult to ignore. Gradually, things became a little clearer. 
they started to understand that these events were completely spiritual in nature and resembled ancient stories and descriptions of what the Bible called demons. It seems amazing, he says, that the ET believing UFOologists and even skeptics have noticed that modern alien abductions resembled ancient stories of demons, yet they have ignored the world's most famous and best-selling book, the Bible, which explains about their origins. Compare the spiritual nature of UFO sightings with the character of alien abductions, and surely we have to begin to realize that these entities are not real physical ETs from other planets, they are from another dimension, just as Valet, Keel, Mac, and so many other UFO researchers have stated from different sides of the fence, and they have concluded, quote, so to find their source, one needs to wear spiritual glasses. He says, unfortunately, most of these modern day researchers have embraced a humanistic based view of this world with the theory of evolution serving as the creator of both them and the aliens. He said this opens them up to spiritual deception and in turn has blinded them to the claims of the Bible, which makes God the creator. He says, in conclusion, I suggest that the answers they have been looking for but do not want to hear may be, quote, God is real and the Bible is true. This interpretation is further supported by the Space Brothers' single-minded obsession with undermining the Bible's account of the nature and mission of the, listen, the only one who appears to be able to stop them, and that, of course, is Jesus. Gee whiz, folks, come on, maybe it's just me, but it sounds like we're dealing with demons here. Put, put all this together. I mean, if it walks like a demon, if it talks like a demon, if it acts like a demon, if it's rebuked in the name of Jesus Christ like a demon, I'm kind of thinking we're dealing with demons here, okay? How much more proof do you need? That's what we're dealing with here. Well, hi, this is Pastor Billy Crohn of Sunrise Baptist Church and Get a Life Ministries. And I hope you enjoyed today's study. But in closing, before you go, let me ask you one final question. If you were to die today, are you sure that you go to heaven and not hell? You see, here's the problem. The Bible says that nobody automatically gets to go to heaven. And that's because God is holy and we are not. The Bible says that the wages of our sin or our unholiness or the wrong things that we have done have separated us from God. And the wages of our sin or unholiness uh, means that we deserve to die and receive God's judgment to go to hell and not heaven. In other words, we're disqualified for heaven. And that's because God being holy and us being not, the two cannot mix. So what are we going to do? Well, that's bad enough. The other problem is we don't even want to admit this dilemma, even though God already knows it all. And so out of love, God gave us something called the Ten Commandments to show us that we're really disqualified for heaven. We're not holy. We're not perfect like him. Uh, let's take a, a look at just a few of those uh, here today. Uh, the Bible says, the Ten Commandments says, you shall not bear false witness. That means lying. How many of you ever told a lie before? Well, those of you who didn't raise your hand, you just did. Okay, let's be honest, folks. Let's not tell another lie. We've all lied. Well, believe it or not, that disqualifies you for heaven. That's how holy God is. He is the truth. He does not lie. And so that makes us a liar. Another of the Ten Commandments says you shall not steal, okay? How many have ever taken anything without permission? Well, all of our hands should have went up at that one. Uh, we've already said we're a bunch of liars, okay? Well, we've all done that. And it doesn't have to be a bank. Uh, it could be a pencil in the third grade. Uh, that means that we're a thief, okay? The Bible says that God is so holy, even his name is holy. And that's why one of the Ten Commandments says you shall not use the Lord's name in vain, Hey, folks, isn't it ironic how uh, now the blessed name of Jesus Christ, the Bible says there's no other name under heaven by which men might be saved, Jesus Christ, has now become a cuss word? Folks, the Bible says that's the sin of blasphemy. Okay? And folks, let's be honest. We've used God's name in vain uh, before. The Bible also says in the Ten Commandments, you shall not commit adultery. And Jesus takes the standard even higher. He says, listen, it's not just physical adultery. He says, surely I tell you, that if you look at another person with lust in your eye, you've committed adultery in your heart. God looks at the heart. 
One more out of the Ten Commandments says, you shall not murder. And you might say, well, hey, I haven't done that one. Really? The Bible says that the sin of hatred is akin to the sin of murder. You, in other words, in your heart, wish they were dead. You pulled the trigger, if you will, in your own heart. And the Bible says God sees that and it's just as bad. He knows the mind. He knows the hearts, the thoughts, and the intents that we have. Folks, that's just five out of the Ten Commandments. How are you doing? Not very well. None of us can keep them. They're God's x-ray to show us that we're disqualified. And so when, not if, your time comes, because we're all marching towards the grave at different speeds, you're going to have to stand before God. And you're going to have to uh, say who you really are. He already knows. Hey, God, let me into heaven. Uh, I'm, I'm a liar. I'm a thief. I'm a blasphemer, adulterer, and a murderer. Folks, the Bible is clear. Such people as these will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. That's the problem. Here's the good news. God so loved the world that he sent his one and only begotten son, Jesus Christ, that whoever believes in him, what he did on the cross, on our behalf, that we will not perish, we will not go to hell, but he will give us the gift of eternal life. Jesus died on the cross to forgive us of all of our sins. It's something that we don't earn. We, we, we can't earn. It's a gift, the Bible calls it. And a gift cannot be earned. He was taking the death penalty in our place. That's what the cross was of the day. And that if we would just ask Jesus Christ to forgive us of our sins and believe that in our heart that God raised him from the grave, showing that his death is satisfactory to God to forgive us of all of our sins, no matter what we've done, the Bible says we shall be saved. Uh, the Apostle Paul says that if we confess with our mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the grave, we will be saved. Let me give you a common analogy of what God's doing and what he did for us with Jesus dying on the cross on our behalf. Uh, in life, we know that people uh, can be sentenced for a crime uh, to where they're actually on death row. Uh, the courtroom scene has completely finished. The gavel has already sounded. Uh, they are going to jail and they're just awaiting their time before they go to the death penalty. Uh, as they're sitting there in the jail cell, uh, it, it's a proven fact they did what they did. Everybody knows it. They're just waiting for that time for their uh, number to come up, so to speak, and walk down that hall and be executed. Uh, there's nothing they could do to reverse their crime. No amount of good works in that jail cell can reverse what they've done. It's too late. It's over. But believe it or not, there's one way that people even today can get off a death row. And that's if the one in authority, the governor, if he were to, out of mercy and kindness, nothing that the person did, because they don't earn it and they don't deserve it, and they can't earn it, if he would grant them what's called a pardon, out of the kindness of his heart, he has the authority to grant them a pardon and absolve them completely of their crimes uh, against the state. And did you know that there's actually been people that this has happened to, that the governor, out of mercy, has granted them a pardon as a gift, and they've gone down to the jail cell and handed that person, extended it through the bars, here, I'm granting you a pardon. If you would just receive it, you can go free right now. And did you know that there's actually been people who've said, no, I don't want your pardon. And so what happened is of their own doing, even though they had a way out, they still had to go to the death penalty. Folks, can I tell you something? That's what God did for us with Jesus dying on the cross. He sent his son to take the death penalty in our place. He, God, has the authority to grant us through Jesus a complete pardon. And every day that you're still alive, God is extending to you spiritually this pardon. But a pardon does you no good unless you reach out and receive it by faith. Won't you do that today? Won't you call upon the name of Jesus Christ? Ask him, to forgive you of all of your sins, to trust in his work on the cross, to pardon us from all of our crimes, our sins against God. God loves you. He wants a relationship with you. But there's only one way to heaven. It's Jesus. There's only one way to get off a death row. It's through the cross of Jesus Christ. Won't you do that right now? Well, this has been Pastor Billy Crone of Sunrise Baptist Church and, and Get a Life Ministries. And if there's anything that we can do for you, uh, please don't hesitate uh, to contact us. Uh, our number, our information will uh, come up here on the screen shortly. 
And uh, uh, if there's anything we could do for you, please don't hesitate to let us know. Uh, thank you for uh, joining us. And uh, remember, I hope to see you in heaven. God bless. Thank you for watching this presentation from Sunrise Baptist Church. If you would like to send us a letter or any other kind of postage, you can reach us at 1780 Betty Lane, Las Vegas, Nevada, 89156. For more information, you can give us a call at 702-452-8599 or email us at bcrone at getalifemedia.com or you can visit our website at www.getalifemedia.com. Billy Crone and this ministry can also be found on Facebook and Twitter. Join us for services at www.sunriselv.com.